Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Gregoire, your association's legislative director. We want to welcome our NISAC members and guests that have joined us for today's webinar on state and federal funding, financing, and resources for municipalities through the Office of Community Renewal with New York State. Um, I want to take a moment here and thank Jeanette Stanziano, our Director of Education and Training, for working with me and our presenters this morning. Jeanette, uh, do we have any housekeeping items that you want to clarify at this time? Yes, Ryan. Good morning, everyone. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, we will be having a Q&A at the end of the program. Please submit your questions in writing through your webinar mm -hmm. dashboard. If you just click on the questions tab, an area will drop down. You can type in your question and submit it. And then when we get to the Q&A, Ryan will read questions for our panelists. The other, um, the other point I wanted to remind everybody, we will be recording this webinar and posting it in the um, later afternoon today on the NISEC website under education. And then um, a navigation bar will drop down and then just click on webinars. That will be put up with the recording and a PDF of the slide deck. Thanks, Ryan. Great, thank you, Jeanette. Um, and before I introduce our guest speakers who are with us today, I would like to thank our webinar sponsor this morning, James McGinnis and Associates and Consulting. If your county is looking to reduce the burden of grant administration, time and effort compliance, or Article 6 state aid reporting, James McGinnis and Associates can help. And I'll just put in a plug before we go to the video in a moment that NISAC is working very hard uh, with all of the county members this year to increase Article 6 state aid funding for our public health departments. Um, so again, James McGinnis and Associates is here to help uh, your counties with that. Let's go now um, to the brief video message from our sponsor. Hello, I'm Peter Bombard from James McGinnis and Associates. Thank you to NISAC for the opportunity to sponsor this webinar and thank you for your time. You'll likely know of us from our preschool software that is currently in 45 counties in New York State. What you may not know is that we also provide many other services to governments, including software consulting. The theme that runs through everything we do is productivity leverage through the application of technology. Our focus is on helping you make the most of your limited staff resources by using technology to improve productivity. So whether you are looking to add value to your existing systems, supplement your current technical staff, ease the burden of regulatory compliance, or gain new insights into your operations, we can help. Gratis allows you to manage, capture, and report on employee time, effort, and mileage in conjunction with grant expenditures. This allows you to reduce the burden of grant administration, time and effort compliance, and Article 6 state aid reporting. Features include user-friendly time and effort collection and reporting, eHIPS time and effort import, digital signatures for timesheets and approvals, immediate simple configuration to add new categories, payroll and ledger imports, push button grant claiming and Article 6 state aid data generation, New York State DOH compliant time and effort reporting, an audit proven system, and our ongoing maintenance includes updates for new state aid submission requirements. Learn more about Gratis at www.jmcginnis.com forward slash Gratis, or call or email us to schedule a demo to see for yourself how Gratis can help. Thank you again for your time. Okay, thank you to uh, James McGinnis and Associates for sponsoring uh, this webinar this morning. We're grateful for their support in helping us to inform and educate hundreds of counties officials from across the state. Our guest speakers today are Charlie Fillion, the Program Director for State and Community Development Block Grant Program for Public Infrastructure, Facilities, Housing, and Community Planning at the Office of Community Renewal. Charlie joined the Office of Community Renewal in 2007 and currently serves as the Program Director with over 20 years of experience, 
Charlie works with communities across the state to address sewer, water infrastructure, housing, and local economic development needs. He represents OCR on the state co-funding initiative and earned a master's of regional planning from the University at Albany. Our second presenter, Scott LaMountain, is the program director for CDBG Economic Development at New York State Homes and Community Renewal. Scott has worked in community and economic development for 14 years, first as a private sector consultant and then in state government. His current position is program director for CDBG Economic Development with NYS HCR, provides daily opportunities to partner with local government to build capacity, grow business, and to break job creating projects through the marketplace. Scott is a native New Yorker and currently lives just north of Albany with his wife and five children. And at this time, I want to turn today's presentation over to Charlie and Scott. And again, thank you both for being with us. Great, and uh, thanks to both Jeanette and Ryan for the opportunity to talk with everybody today about community development funding um, with the, the Association of Counties. And so let's get started. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, so again, we're going to give you a broad overview. New York State Homes and Community Renewal, or HCR, consists of all the state's major housing and community renewal agencies, including the Affordable Housing Corporation, the Division of Housing and Community Renewal, Housing Finance Agency, State of New York Mortgage Agency, and the Housing Trust Fund Corporation, and others. As an office within the Division of Housing and Community Renewal, the Office of Community Renewal, or OCR, administers the state CDBG program along with a variety of state and federal resources to empower local governments and not-for-profit organizations to build on the unique and historic character of New York's communities through housing, infrastructure, and job creation activities. New York State Homes and Community Renewal, again, consists of uh, the Affordable Housing Corporation, the Division of Housing and Community Renewal, HFA, or Housing Finance Agency, Sunny May, and again, the Housing Trust Fund Corporation. And if we go to the next slide. So this is a basic layout of the programs. OCR operates uh, using what New York State Homes and Community Re Renewal refers to as a LPA or local program administrator approach. HCR provides grants to municipalities and not-for-profits who become the LPAs and then become the responsible entities for administering the grant locally. Then they grant or loan the funds to individual property owners or businesses. The LPAs make local funding decisions and are responsible for compliance with program rules. And if we go to the next slide. So I'm gonna give you again a broad overview of the state federal funding uh, programs. So at the federal level, uh, OCR administers uh, the federally funded state and funded programs. In addition to the New York State CWG program that is the focus of today's presentation, OCR administers the following federal funds from HUD. It's the HUD Home Investment Partnership or HOME program, the New York State Disaster Recovery, and the HUD Comprehensive Housing Counseling Program. And under the state side, you've got the Affordable Housing Corporation, Access to Home, the Restore, MMHR, or Manufactured Mobile Housing Replacement Program, and again, the New York State Housing Program. And if we go to the next slide. So the CWG Program Overview, CWG, again, is a federally funded program that provides funding to develop affordable housing, create suitable living environments, and enhance opportunities for low and moderate income persons. By low and moderate income, I mean a household that earns less than 80% of the area median income adjusted for family size is calculated by HUD or the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Larger cities in urban counties receive direct allocations each year from HUD. The state of New York receives funds to address needs in the balance of the state or non-entitlement jurisdictions not covered by the direct entitlement communities. OCR administers the state's CWG program and sub-allocates the funding to eligible non-entitlement cities, towns, and villages, generally with populations of under 50,000, 
in counties with an unincorporated population generally under 200,000. The funds are allocated through an application process that we will describe in a bit. Recently, the state has been receiving approximately 45 to $50 million annually, although this amount depends on congressional appropriations. New York State receives funding to offer grants to non-entitlement communities throughout the state to meet a variety of goals that includes providing decent housing and suitable living environments for low and moderate income persons. Each activity must meet an eligible activity permitted by the statute and regulations and meet one of the three national objectives. This includes benefiting low and moderate income persons, aiding in the prevention of slums or blight, or meeting an urgent development community development need. The state must ensure that no less than 70% of its funds are used for activities that benefit low and moderate income persons. This primary program objective achieved by using program funds predominantly to support activities or projects that benefit low and moderate income families, create job opportunities, and again, prevent in the or elimination of slums and blight, or address a community development need that poses a serious and imminent threat to the community's health or welfare. For communities claiming the LOMAD benefit for an activity, at least 51% of those benefiting from the activity must be determined to be low or moderate income, except for certain imminent threat projects. And so if we go to the home, so this is a quick home overview of the uh, home program. Uh, they do activities with respect to home ownership, uh, manufactured housing replacement, home purchase assistance, um, home purchase assistance with rehab, um, and again, also offer home buyer development projects or what they call an LPA or CHODO um, and TBRA, which is tenant based rental assistance. The awards under the home program can vary anywhere from $400,000 up to uh, $600,000 in or 750000 under the home buyer development projects. And if we go to the next slide, uh, so the New York State Main Street program, this is state funds. Um, not for profits and municipalities can apply directly for this. There's various activities. Again, funding for this is available on an annual basis through the consolidated funding application. And if we go to the next, so the Portable Housing Corporation. Again, eligible applicants include municipalities and not-for-profits. It's all areas of the state are eligible. There's no restrictions. Um, the application process for AHC is open round, so you can apply at any point. It's uh, rolling applications and rolling awards. And if we go to access to home, again, this is state funds. This is a program that provides grants to make accessibility or uh, for persons who have mobility issues, uh, making modifications to within existing dwelling units, and the uh, unit needs to be occupied by a person that qualifies as low income. And if we go to the Restore Program, again, this is the Restore Program. Refer its uh, acronym is Residential Emergency Services to offer home repairs. It's a program specifically to the elderly. Um, again, it's, Simple, it's just that it's emergency repairs, and that again is uh, state funds and not for profits and municipalities can both apply for funding through that. And next, we have the uh, mobile manufactured home replacement program, again, state funds, eligible applicants, again, not for profits, municipalities, it's all areas of the state. Um, one thing I do want to point out with this is the uh, maximum funding per unit is $100,000. And generally speaking, you can partner with one of the other programs that we just covered, the CDBG or HOME. Um, we can provide the gap in financing if your costs do exceed $100,000. And now we're going to get into, we can go to the next slide. We're going to talk about the eligible activities, and I'm going to hand this off to Scott for the next section. Thanks, Charlie. Um, so at this point in the presentation, we're going to pivot a little bit and focus uh, a bit more on CDBG, Community Development Block Grant. Um, CDBG can fund a wide range of activities that benefit low and moderate income households and communities. So 
So some of the most common activities that we fund are um, things like housing rehabilitation to help address health and safety uh, of shelter, as well as manufactured housing. Um, home ownership, which includes down payment, mortgage subsidy assistance, as well as closing costs. Private water or wastewater systems, um, that would include wells, uh, septic, uh, laterals, um, public infrastructure, uh, which includes drinking water, sanitary sewer, stormwater projects, as well as private systems. We see uh, folks applying for public facilities, and that would include things like senior centers, healthcare centers, daycares, and then projects to um, address ADA compliance or accessibility uh, concerns. We also fund economic development projects, which are larger business concerns, uh, over 25 employees, small business systems, those are smaller business concerns with 25 or fewer employees, micro enterprise development, and that includes businesses of five or fewer employees, including the owner. And then community planning, which is uh, meant to help folks develop uh, strategic plans for uh, future assistance. This cannot fund comprehensive strategic or master plans, but it's rather meant to focus on a particular topic. This is a broad range of, of eligible activities. Uh, so we're gonna go into a little more depth about each of these, um, public infrastructure and then economic development, and then finally housing. So I'm gonna hand it uh, back off to Charlie for uh, infrastructure. Great, thanks Scott. So I'm gonna to touch quickly here on the funding for infrastructure. Uh, so again, public infrastructure, we're generally talking sanitary store, drinking water. Um, it also can include stormwater management projects. Um, we do work directly within um, mobile home parks. It's one of the unique features of the CWG program. But again, let's start with public improvements. In general, public projects, uh, as I said, fall into two categories, public infrastructure, public service facilities. Public infrastructure activities include, but are not limited to, water source development, water treatment, storage and distribution, and also sanitary sewage collection and treatment, flood control, and stormwater drainage. Public infrastructure may also include publicly owned utilities. That does require consultation with OCR prior to applying for funding. Eligible projects may also include the repair or replacement of existing systems, construction of new systems in developed areas, or expansion of existing systems into areas previously unserved that are in compliance with New York State Smart Growth Compliance Infrastructure Act. Uh, you want to make, pay attention to differences between city and village systems versus a water or sewer district. Um, we can get into areas that deal with target areas. It's maybe you're not gonna address the entire system, but just a one neighborhood. Um, as I touched on earlier, we do private system within manufactured mobile home parks. Again, the critical thing with infrastructure is 51% of the persons benefiting the service area, the residents 51% have to qualify as lower and moderate income. And there's a number of different ways that we'll get into later in how to determine that. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, um, again, funding material, at this time there's nothing open. Uh, funding material and application guidance will be, is anticipated to be open later uh, in 2021. You can always go to the funding raw materials at any point to see what's currently available. And if we go to the next slide, so on the public infrastructure, there's a lot of focus on uh, co-funding. The infrastructure projects often are large multi-million dollar projects. Um, you saw the funding limits. Uh, Jeanette, if we can go back a couple slides to the uh, public, yeah, right here. So you see those are the funding caps. So uh, again, a city, town, village, you can come in, apply for up to a million dollars without the co-funding. With other funding in place that's committed, you see the slightly higher thresholds and uh, joint applications. There's a few of these across the state, not necessarily at the county level, but we did one up in the village of uh, Carthage and the, um, there was a joint project between two municipalities. And we did another one in Allegheny County between the villages of Bolivar and Richburg. Joint ownership, joint cost, joint benefit, uh, both communities apply uh, together at the same time. So uh, if we go back to the, uh, the co-funding slide, Jeanette, 
Ben, what we're talking about here is that funding for your project um, has been applied for and you've got a commitment of funds from one of these other sources that we partner with. So there's a broad list here from environmental facilities, there's a broad list with USDA rural development, and then we also do a lot of work uh, with the New York uh, the Department of State with the Appalachian Regional Commission and a uh, Underutilized resource, I think, is the Northern Border Regional Commission. Um, it's a large spot of the state that's eligible um, for that. So Scott's going to talk to you now about public facility activities. Thanks, Charlie. So um, having some technical difficulties here. Um, when we talk about public facilities, uh, what we're talking about primarily is assisting um, with improvements to facilities that are serving groups of populations that HUD considers to be um, categorically uh, low mod. Um, but these these are some of the facilities that uh, that we generally are able to help. Um, things like the healthcare centers, daycare centers, senior centers. Uh, community centers. And one important piece I would mention here is that we, as a program, are generally are not able to assist units of local government with a kind of general purpose buildings used for the conduct of you know local government processes. I mean, the one exception would be we can um, help with handicapped accessibility improvements. So whether that's uh, an elevator or some other improvement allowing handicapped access to a building. Um, or accessible, accessible sidewalks. Those are the kinds of things that we can uh, help pay for under the public facility uh, category. Hey, Scott, I just want to jump in for a second quickly. I um, apologize for that. I uh, lost my place here. Um, but with respect to public facilities, I want to point out one specific thing is, as Scott said, the ADA compliance is a Big issue. We see a lot of applications for that on an annual basis. Um, ADA compliance refers specifically to the physical removal of architectural barriers within existing buildings. So if your municipality that you're working with is discussing construction of a new facility, ADA compliance is not eligible under that scenario because you have to be, if you're building from the ground up, your building has to be in compliance with state building code. Um, it's not the removal of architectural barriers at that point. It's again, just stressing, pointing out the distinction. This is existing buildings with the physical removal of existing barriers. Thanks, Charlie. So we're moving on to talk a little bit about economic development funding. We can advance to the next slide. So the Office of Community Renewal recognizes that New York's smaller communities has to, has to have an economy that encourages business development and, and promotes jobs. And our focus is on low and moderate income persons and communities. So through our economic development program, the OCR provides grants to communities that want to sponsor economic development activities that create or retain jobs for low and moderate income persons. Um, for details and to kind of outline more of what we're talking about here, um, all of the all of the guidelines for this program are available at the website um, at the end of the slide. Um, economic development funds are flexible and can be used for most legitimate business purposes. Those eligible uses include, but are not limited to, acquisition of real property, financing of machinery, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, building construction and renovation. On that note that while these are permissible uses, new construction of buildings uh, is only permissible under economic development, which is uh, assistance for kind of that largest tier of business over 25 employees. And also note that if our funds are involved in, in construction, it can trigger uh, Davis-Bacon. So keep that in mind. But we can also use economic development funds for working capital, inventory, and employee training expenses. Um, just quickly, the structure for economic development is uh, the maximum award for that highest tier, again, the largest businesses, that the maximum award is $750,000. Um, 
and we can pay up to 40% of a total project cost. The project must result in the creation or retention of at least one permanent full-time equivalent job for every $15,000 of New York State CDBG funds awarded. Projects claiming job retention must receive prior approval from OCR. That is very, retention is a very particular uh, set of projects and, and a set of thresholds uh, that HUD allows us to undertake, but you do need to talk to us first. Funding can also be provided to foster small business development growth. That's kind of that second bucket or second tier of projects we see come in. For the purpose of the small business program, a small business is defined as a commercial enterprise with 25 or fewer full-time equivalent employees, or FTEs as we call them, at the time of application. Small business awards uh, are up to $100,000 and available to individual businesses. New York State CBG can fund, again, up to 40% of the total project cost and a minimum of 20% owner equity contribution is required. Equity investment prior to the award cannot be counted towards that. These projects, again, must result in the creation or retention of at least one full-time equivalent job per 25,000 of CGB funds provided, and has to result in the creation or retention of permanent jobs, again, at least 51% of which must benefit LMI persons. Um, Microenterprise is the kind of the smallest tier and those are for businesses that have five or fewer employees by headcount um, and that that count that five must include the owner itself um, for economic development small business and micro enterprise those applications are available through an open round process through the governor's consolidated funding application portal it's a two-step process there's a pre-submission that if approved serves essentially as an invitation for your community to support a full application that is all submitted through the CFA portal. Applicants must be unit of local government. Businesses and non-for-profits, unfortunately, are not eligible um, to either submit an application. And we, uh, we're only able to assist for-profit businesses uh, through, through these uh, funding sources. Um, just a quick note on microenterprise. Um, the, there is an, an owner equity requirement of 10%. And uh, the requirements are met by either creating a job, full-time equivalent job made available to a lower moderate income person, or the owner of the business themselves can be lower moderate income. That is, uh, that exception is available for micro enterprise only. Okay, we can advance the slide. Um, so this, this is really kind of just indicating what we had discussed before, um, that we accept economic development applications uh, throughout the year on a rolling basis. Um, our deadlines are generally the first Friday of each month for a full application, and then we do our best to advance that uh, application to the following month's board meeting. So by our standards, it's pretty quick, um, but it does involve some planning and some thought um, so we encourage you to reach out often and early to our office so that we can kind of discuss timing and how best that we can, uh, we can assist you. So with that, I'm going to hand it back off to Charlie to talk about housing. Great, thanks. Um, so, yeah, housing. Um, for Right now, I've actually got a round open. Um, we are accepting applications, as you can see on the screen, th through April 9th, 2021. Um, there are generally five types of housing projects eligible for OCR funding. Uh, this can include housing rehab of either owner or rental units, single or multi-unit structures. This can include activities to address health and safety issues, code violations. All rehab must address lead-based paint compliance. We also do a manufactured housing replacement. It's a separate program. Um, we do discourage the rehab of manufactured housing over 10 years old. Uh, but if you are looking at a manufactured housing replacement program, again, uh, we allow replacement with another unit. Uh, but we do also encourage replacement with a stick built or modular on site. Direct homeownership assistance uh, can include mortgage subsidies, down payment assistance, and closing costs. And there's typically also the housing stack in New York is old. Uh, so we typically also see a rehab um, activity as an ancillary activity. We also do private water, wastewater systems uh, through wells and septic replacement. 
This can also include any engineering costs that the homeowner would normally incur. Um, and we can also address any uh, required internal plumbing modifications. Lateral connections to public and water sewer systems is also eligible. Uh, this again can include um, if you have somebody that's currently on a well or septic and you're hooking them into a public system and we need to make some internal plumbing modifications, again, that's all eligible um, as part of our normal process. Uh, so if we can just go through the, I'm going to slide off here, apologies for that. Um, and then there's also accessibility improvements uh, that you can get into. Uh, so home ownership, um, this can include direct financial assistance. Again, as I said, down payment closing costs. Uh, counseling of prospective homeowners to ensure applicants understand program ob obligations, budgeting, and overhead costs that is required. Um, and we also, as I said, we also see typically there's some rehab component uh, with the home purchase. A successful homeownership application is going to include information on the way the program will be marketed to potential applicants. It's going to include a list of eligible applicants that have expressed an interest to document the market and the need. And you're also going to do a real estate analysis, um, including average cost of homes and the number of homes available within the price range and evidence of the amount available that you've got a, uh, you're meeting the need and the demand. Homeownership requires demonstration of need and demand and a clear analysis of the local real estate market. Need could be demonstrated by low ownership rates. Demand is evidenced by demonstrating that enough households have requested assistance. For the real estate market, you want to make sure that you're describing your current target real estate market. Specifically, you want to outline, outline the number of homes available by type, uh, single family, two family, et cetera. And under the rental market, you want to, again, describe the market, which is spe uh, specifically available, um, how many bedrooms, which the current vacancy rates. Go to the next slide. So private water wastewater systems. Again, this is direct assistance. It can include the drilling of wells, construction or rehab of septic systems, and the installation of lateral connections. Again, lateral connections to public systems, we can only assist households that have been determined to be low and moderate income. Um, I mentioned that under the public infrastructure, if you're doing a large um, water or sewer project and you're replacing laterals or connecting folks, if it's a new system, again, the lateral connection can be included actually as part of that uh, main activity. If we go to the next slide. so. Again, kind of a broad description of the available funding sources. Again, CWG, as I said, has the round open right now. Cities, towns, villages are eligible to apply for up to 500,000. Uh, counties are eligible to apply for up to a million. And you've got the other uh, funding programs. This uh, other home is the other federal program. And then you've got the state funding uh, listed. Uh, you can leverage those, the CWG funds with any of these other programs. If we go to the next slide, so manufactured um, housing, again, same funding caps, uh, 500,000 for cities, towns, villages, up to a million for counties. Um, again, we are actively encouraging the, if you have a replacement, um, we do actively encourage the replacement of the manufactured unit with either a stick built or um, a modular. Uh, the CWG program, has no limit, there is no cap on the per unit cost for investment for a new unit. Um, so we do, I see costs vary anywhere for the replacement program, anywhere from eighty-five dollars to $150,000, depending on the location in the state and any uh, site work that might be required to get the project uh, underway. So if we go to the next slide, again, for home ownership. The two programs that specifically offer home ownership assistance is the state CWG program and the home program. And if we go to the next slide, uh, and here's your available funding for uh, wells and septic. Again, CWG is unique that this is CWG is the only program under OCR that uh, will allow uh, lateral connections. And I'm going to hand it back to Scott. He's going to talk to us about community planning.
Thanks, Charlie. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so finally, and kind of the litany of things that we can help you with, CDBG funds can also be requested as community planning grants, or you could consider them technical assistance grants. Um, we don't have an active round right now, but as Charlie said, you know, we hopefully expect to have more opportunities for this particular source later in the year. Um, so these are planning projects that require minimum 5% cash equity. Donated services and in-kind services are not considered eligible toward that match requirement. These funds can be used to facilitate uh, the retention of professional services or consultants to uh, a participating communities planning committee that identifies vulnerabilities or damaged assets or uh, needs within your community. Um, the idea is that you're going to get help to help to complete studies to identify these vulnerabilities. And the idea is that this, this will allow your community to begin the long-term process of implementing a plan and getting ready to apply for funding in the future. Um, so this is kind of your preliminary step to get ready to submit a full CDBG application for infrastructure, economic development, or housing. So an important distinction here is the community does not need to be 51% low and moderate income. You're not demonstrating national objective. But the intention is that the final report, once implemented, will in fact benefit a lower moderate income population. So that's community planning. So we can advance to the next slide. Um, so with what time we have, we want to just quickly run through from kind of a CDBG-centric perspective uh, project development. So if we look here, uh, there's just a few big picture issues that we see across our communities as, as they start thinking about their needs. We work with communities of all different sizes, but most of our projects are undertaken in smaller rural areas across the state. And one of the biggest challenges we see is capacity. Um, this is where county government often can step in, either with their own staff or by working with their IDA or LDC or housing nonprofits to help move projects along. So identifying those key partners from what we've seen will go a long way toward getting ready to pursue funding for a project. Um, we see a lot of needs to upgrade existing water and wastewater systems, but there's often an ongoing struggle to make sure those rates locally are able to support maintenance and fund future improvements. And we acknowledge that costs uh, never go down. So over time, we've tried to adjust our program cap to uh, match the reality. Um, we can help, again, scale our assistance to help meet those needs. You can go to the next slide. But where to begin? Um, Fortunately, at the county level, uh, many folks have master strategic plans in place to help guide that decision making across your component communities. This can help identify specific needs as it relates to those big areas, whether it's housing, economic development, public facilities, or infrastructure. If more work is needed to drill down on a particular issue or geography, some sources um, can allow you to tap for planning funds. All right, we can go to the next slide. So um, our advice here is to involve partners, including regulatory agencies early and often, whatever the activity is that you're pursuing. So for instance, if it's water or sewer, uh, DEC, Department of Health, any other regulating agencies should be brought in early. If it's housing, reach out to your housing nonprofits, local weatherization agencies, public housing authorities. If it's economic development, talk to your IDAs, your LDCs, Chamber of Commerce, Empire State Development, and of course, include OCR, um, because we can help make those connections, we can help um, kind of point out next steps. Um, but all of these folks, um, I think you're going to find at the state level, will help you guide the project, kind of educate um, about what the accomplishments of beneficiaries would be, and ensure that your project design will meet uh, the, the approval criteria. So it doesn't mean that we design a project to meet a funding source, but rather, once you have a project in mind, you can help kind of, we can help figure out how best to stage that project to so have the best chances of getting funded. So, if you advance to the next slide. Um, so, we have to be practical. A good project takes many years. Building partnerships takes time. We've seen in our tenure many projects that develop slowly, but that still ultimately meet with success. Um, the slide you'll see does mention kind of turnover of administration. This seems particularly relevant lately as the pandemic has led to early retirement of many community development practitioners across the state. 
so we want to be sensitive to that loss of institutional knowledge. Um, so if you need to reach out to other counties or other groups that are engaged in the same kind of work or that have um, experience with our office, you know, draw on your colleagues for that experience. Um, you know, we will get through this. We'll build that knowledge back up. But, um, you know, we're happy, again, to help make those connections any way we can. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but moving from planning to implementation requires that you start to develop the tools needed to share your project with the various funding agencies. So for our agency, that could mean a preliminary engine, an engineering report for water and wastewater projects. It could mean a housing condition survey for a housing rehabilitation program or even sample uh, work write-ups. And go to the next slide. And as noted before, involve the funding agencies early and often. Your path to success will often involve cobbling together funding from many different sources, both public and private. And I should note that for CDBG funded projects, the expectation is that all your other sources are firmly locked down and committed at the time of application. CDBG is seen as gap financing, right? So we're supposed to be the last in to a project, which means that everything else should be in place at the time of application. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Couple more quick points. Uh, each agency is gonna have its own metrics for determining eligibility and competitiveness. You know, so read the application materials carefully and fully. Uh, CDBG applications are generally scored based on need, impact, financial capacity, and administrative capacity, as well as past performance. Each CDBG program area has slightly different requirements and supporting documentation needed. Um, remember, you can request technical assistance from our office right up until submission of the application, and that is true across all of our uh, project areas. Next slide, please. And remember that for most programs, CDBG included, the best projects are those that draw on a variety of funding sources. So as equity, loans, other grants are added into that funding quilt, the greater preference we're generally able to offer. And as, I, as I noted, um, CDBG is intended to be last in, up in into a project and should function as gap financing. And um, as, as kind of a takeaway, take advantage of that technical assistance. Call us. Um, we're accessible. We're available. We want to help you uh, bring projects uh, that are going to be successful to the marketplace. And uh, here's a, a long-standing slide that we like to include um, in our presentations. If you'll go to the next slide is um, we can accomplish more when we work together. So let's get organized and talk about projects early. And I am going to hand it back off to Charlie to kind of take us out here. Thanks. Great, thanks, Scott. So kind of taking through the steps, the development stage, and now it's all right, ready to apply for funds. Again, Scott and I, as practitioners of this, um, Scott and I previously worked together on the private side as consultants. Um, and we continue to have a good working relationship. It's one of the things that we want to stress to everybody, and Scott alluded to this a couple slides previous to this, is just because there's funding available, don't apply for the funding to fit your project. You really have to go out and develop your project, and then your funding falls into place with it. So with that said, it's, you know, you're ready to apply for funds, and this is the process. So for most of our projects, it's going to go through the CFA, um, the Consolidated Funding Application Process, that's for the public infrastructure, the facilities. Um, Scott's program with Microenterprise and the other economic development programs is all through the open round. Community planning continues to be through the CFA. Housing activities are through CDOL. That is a uh, OCR program. It's the Community Development Online. Um, we can walk you through the steps for that if you want to talk about that. Um, but again, it's important to know with respect to the CFA process, you need to access the application instructions for applying. You can do that at regionalcouncils.ny.gov. Um, please not, you know, again, there's typically annual funding. Um, the economic development program, again, in small business, microenterprise, those are all now open round projects. And if we go to the next 
slide. So again, just some additional information for everybody. Um, this is a great toolkit. Um, it's this Hot Exchange. It's all been available to anybody. You can just click on the link. Um, it'll take you right through there. It's a great resource. Um, and again, as Scott said, technical assistance, we are here, we're available. We pick up the phone. It's, I know it's state government, but we are actually really here to help. Um, so, Jeanette, I'm not sure if we want to get into questions. Yes, thank you, Charlie and Scott, for that presentation. A ton of information for county members, really useful uh, presentation. I know I've got a few questions here in the um, comment box asking uh, if this slide presentation will be made available, and yes, it will be. We'll be posting it to the NISAC website, nisac.org slash webinars at the conclusion, along with the recording of this presentation. So uh, a bunch of questions have come in. I want to start off the first question, and I'm not sure, Charlie or Scott, if you'll be able to answer this. Um, I don't know the answer to this question, but with the new federal COVID relief funds as provided in the American Rescue Plan Act, can those funds be used as a cash match, a county local match for any of these grant programs? So I guess the question is, can you use um, the new federal money as the local match for any of these grant programs? Uh, yeah, this is Charlie. So, uh, again, we don't have that much information. I know that this, the bill has been passed. We don't actually have a funding allocation specific to our program. What I can talk about is the CARES Act that was uh, passed a year ago. Um, you know, that program is specific. A, it's specifically intended as a response to COVID or future pandemics. Um, but, yeah, generally speaking, um, you can use multiple federal sources um, to uh, get your your financing in place. I, again, it's I, I don't have any specifics on this the rescue plan that was the the president signed yesterday. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to play out in terms of housing, economic development, the other criteria that we get into. And Scott, I don't know if you have any comments. Uh, just one quick thing here. The as, as Charlie said, we're as an office, we're we're you know it's no secret you know the state was provided an allocation under the CARES Act, and we're still putting together guidance on how that's going to be released. The uh, the thing I will tell you to be very cautious of is duplication of benefits. HUD is laser focused on making sure that for every funding decision we make, that we can clearly demonstrate there's no duplication of benefits. So while we're pretty flexible about uh, matching requirements and there's not a lot in our program but where there is we're, we're flexible but the onus will be on our our communities and applicants to demonstrate that there's no duplication of benefits and we have some tools to help with that but um, it's something to keep in mind particularly with kind of the panoply of federal assistance programs being offered uh, whether it's PPP or idle or whatever it is we just have to keep that in the back of our minds with everything that we do Excellent, thank you. Thank you both for that. Um, first, our next question is, how many projects can a municipality apply for? Can we submit projects in multiple categories? And can a municipality subcontract with an entitlement community for LPA responsibilities? What responsibilities must remain with the applicant? Okay, so I wanna, and I'll let Scott chime in too, uh, but I, because you mentioned the word entitlement. Um, I just want, I want to mention specifically that for anybody that's on the call, if you're in Erie County, Monroe County, Onondaga County, and with the metro counties around New York City, uh, Dutchess, Orange, Rockland, Westchester, uh, the New York City um, counties, Nassau and Suffolk, those are all entitlement jurisdictions. So what we're talking about today is not specific to anything within any of those uh, those counties. But in terms of the funding caps, each 
program area has a specific funding cap on an annual basis. So um, the public facilities has a cap of, you know, depending on how you're coming in, if it's a single standalone or joint co-funded of between a million and a million seven fifty. Again, housing has caps, you know, at the county level of a million. Um, so each of those individual projects can be applied for on an annual basis up to those funding limits. And uh, again, kind of the same criteria applies on uh, Scott's side of the program with respect to the economic development. Uh, we do allow what we call a subrecipient relationship. Uh, a subrecipient sub specifically means that you're partnering with a not-for-profit. This happens a lot on the housing side of the program where a uh, St. Lawrence County, for example, partners with the St. Lawrence Housing Council. Um, the St. Lawrence Housing Council then undertakes the project on behalf of the county. Um, I've got another great partnership out in Chautauqua County, um, Chautauqua Home Rehab. Uh, they partner with the county to administer the county's housing programs. So that can be implied. I'm not quite sure what the uh, person that posted the question, what they meant by partnering with a, an entitlement jurisdiction. Um, Ryan has got our contact, our contact information is up here on the screen, so you can, whoever submitted the question can certainly um, email Scott or I directly, and we can certainly provide feedback. So if you're, Ryan, if you're going to provide a Q&A uh, as part of this, we can uh, provide a more formal response. I, I'm a little long-winded there with that, but Scott, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, Charlie, that's, that's great. That's comprehensive. I would just, a quick plug on economic development is that um, yeah, we wouldn't want to fund the, mul the same business multiple times, but a community can have multiple economic development projects because for economic development and small business, you're identifying a single business. So the only limiting factor would really be uh, local capacity. You know, we would have to have a conversation about how much can you feasibly take on. We don't generally run into it because good economic development projects are difficult to identify that kind of fit with our requirements. Um, Microenterprise, we've basically set a threshold that says, look, if you're able to commit funds within a reasonable amount of time and you're mostly committed, we might talk about continuing to help that program move forward, right? So it's, it's a little different with the open round programs, um, you know, but your, your limiting factor, again, is going to be kind of capacity and what, what you can feasibly handle between you and whatever partners you brought in to help administer the program. So. Great, thank you. Thank you, Charlie, and thank you, Scott. And certainly, um, as Charlie mentioned, everyone's contact information is up here on the board for the various uh, programs. The next question is, uh, can the manufactured home replacement program be utilized on uninhabited slash abandoned trailers? Um, if with respect to the MMHRI, so the replacement has to be on uh, privately owned land. And it's it, the question is going to come down to ownership as to who actually owns the unit and the property at that point. Um, yeah, it's just we would treat that as a one for one uh, replacement under our program. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, is Columbia County an entitlement county? I don't believe they are. No, they're not. All right. And when do you guys expect the community planning funding to be made available? So we had the round that just closed. Um, we, again, just a little background information. Uh, obviously, because of the pandemic, we were unable to go out with our 2020 program year. We finally put that out for the infrastructure facilities micro program in ED. Um, we went out December 30th. That funding round closed on March 5th. Um, we are anticipating at some point later this year that we will have a 2021 round. Uh, so community planning money will be made available through the next 2021 round. And again, I had the link on the slide. You can always check on our website the, um, the funding opportunities section of our website. Um, we'll have updated information when it's going to be made available. Okay, great. And the last uh, question in the in the queue here, it's more it's more common actually. Um, 
is from an individual in a county. Scott and Charlie are an excellent resource. If you haven't dealt with them yet on a specific project program, I encourage you to reach out to them. So that was a nice little plug for the two of you guys. And again, um, just to conclude and wrap up the presentation here, um, I want to thank again our sponsor, James McGinnis and Associates and Consultants for, um, for sponsoring today's webinar. And a, a special thank you, Charlie, to you and Scott um, for coming on and presenting to the counties. I know I, I can speak from, from my observation and watching the PowerPoint and the, and the webinar this afternoon. Um, we'll certainly be engaging with the two of you on, on all of these programs and offerings that HCR has so we can bring this information to the counties. Um, I think there's a lot of great feedback, a lot of great questions, and and I thank you both for joining us. Yep. And so, just uh, Jeanette, just before we close here, can you just back up a couple of slides? Uh, one more. One more. So again, Scott and I, we, I, I realize this, the material that we're presenting is very dry. It's very boring. We like to have fun with this. Uh, so for any of the Star Trek fans out there, Scott and I are both. Star Trek fans, this is the Borg Queen. The reference is just, you know, resistance is futile. Just listen to us and you'll be fine. So I just, <laughs> it, it, it's just a little bit of fun that we like to have with our presentations. That's a great piece of advice, Charlie. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again. And everyone take yep. care. Have a great day. All right. Thanks. Bye.